Are you aware that souls are starving? And what are they starving for? But they're starving for a rest with their Lord in heaven. They need that. The, the, the desire for rest with, the, with God is something that is written into every, every man in this world, every man, woman, and child in this world. In the, the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer makes a plea towards the, uh, towards the Hebrew Christians of the time. We have finished in the Scripture reading at verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 4. Well, let's continue from verse 4 here up until verse 10, where the Hebrew writes, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in, his way, uh, in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from this. What the Hebrew writer is explaining is that the Jews had a day of rest that they were waiting for, the, that long-awaited Messiah when he would come. But, they, but as he explains, that David wasn't speaking only of that day of rest, but of a rest to come later on. And, he, and eventually he's going to speak about the rest in heaven. And he talks how the, many of the Jews did not enter that rest because they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe in the word that he had come to preach. If souls are, star are starving for rest, that's an interesting concept. How do you feed that kind of hunger? How do you get the nutrition necessary to enter the rest of holy God? Uh... <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, hopefully there's a little bit of notice, but I've been dieting for the last two months, and, uh, and, and anybody who has gone into a diet knows that you need to pick a diet that is best suited for your goals. For me, I'm trying simply to lose weight, so I've been cutting carbs and, and emphasizing proteins because as far as I can tell, that that is a good way to simply lose weight, and that's just what I'm trying to do. You've got to pick in any diet the right set of goal, uh, set, uh, the, right, uh, the right set of, uh, of um, you need to pick the right, uh, the diet that helps you meet the goals that you're searching for. So Christians need a diet that is rich in, heaven, in a heaven-minded attitude. So, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews here in this chapter. And often, uh, the Hebrew writer is going to use this term, let us. Let us do this. Let us do that. And so, because I'm a big fan of puns, this sermon is called The Lettuce Diet. Very clever. I know you're very, all very impressed. <laughs> well, we're going to see how can we enter God's rest? What can we do in our life to let us enter the rest of heaven. Christians need to avoid the malnourishment of sin and doubt. Jesus gave us his plan that is going to help us stay in his grace. And if our attitude, therefore, is focused on heaven, we will not be starving for that, God's, or that rest that God offers us in the end. So let's get here in the text, and let's, let's begin with verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to see that uh, what he tells us here. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents 
of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who must give an account. When looking at this passage, we learn several things. And the first thing I want us to focus on is that word diligence here that the Hebrew writer uses. Be diligent to enter that rest. What does it mean to be diligent? Uh, this evening, if, you're, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to have them open and take notes, uh, especially on things like, uh, like words like diligent. If you want to write in the margin of your Bible, I would, uh, the Greek word that is being translated there is the word spudazzo. Uh, you don't have to write that word. I couldn't, it'd be hard for me to tell you in this short amount of time how to spell it. But the word diligent means to be zealous or eager or to take pains to make every effort. It is not simply enough for us to give it a try to enter that rest. What the Hebrew writer is calling us to do is to make every effort. We, ha we can't just simply, you know, take a shot in the dark. We can't simply, uh, you know, put our best foot forward. We've got to give it our all. Everything that we have to enter that rest. It's got to be on every aspect of our being that we are focused on doing that. Our diligence then has to be rooted in something and that must be in obedience. Look at verse 11 again, the, the second half there. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of, of obedience, or of disobedience. Disobedience is going to cause us to fall. This, uh, the Hebrew writer was very clear about the, the, the possibility of apostasy, the possibility of falling away. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, he says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Could it be any more clear that being saved does not mean that you can always be saved necessarily? That you can, of your own choice, through disobedience, fall from grace. Look at the person that the Hebrew writer is speaking of. He's not speaking of somebody who said they were a believer, but actually were not. Said they were one of God's elect, but actually they never were. He's speaking of somebody who was enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who was a partaker of the Holy Spirit. He's describing a Christian. And he warns us desperately that if we were to fall, uh, fall from grace, if we were to continue in disobedience, then there is no longer a sacrifice that remains for us. So we need to make every effort that we can to remain obedient. And what we see here in the last part of this section from verses 12 to 13 is that you can't fake diligence. You can't fake a diligent heart. For the word of God is what? Living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who must give an account. You can't hide your heart from God. If you're not giving your all, if you're not, your heart is not in it, he's going to know. The word of God is a, is a, uh, will find the sinner out. To enter God's rest or commitment to righteousness has to be authentic. It has to be real. A perfect church attendance is, does not matter if we continue to indulge in sin. We need to put all those things aside and we need to focus our entire being, our heart and soul on doing what's right, being obedient to God. And if we do that, we can enter his rest. 
Second thing I want to look at in, in Hebrews chapter 14. Let us hold fast to our confession. Look in verse 14 there. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Our confession is in whom? But Jesus Christ. That's the, the person who we confess. We confess that we believe that Jesus is the, is the Son of God. And by that confession, we make ourselves a candidate to come forward to be baptized and to have our sins washed away. It is by Christ's name that we have salvation. And, and Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that that is the only name that salvation comes by. Salvation does not come by Moses. It does not come by Mohammed. It does not come by anyone but Jesus. God alone saves. And so by confessing Christ, we know that God abides in us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Take a look at that passage really quickly there. 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Abiding meaning he remains in you. If you confess his name. Our confession, we have to understand, is a commitment. To say that Jesus is the Son of God, to say that that's what you believe, that that's what you believe with all of your heart, is to make a commitment to God. Look uh, over in Hebrews chapter 3, just uh, over to the left side of your page, or it might be behind the page. I don't know your Bible. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Look at this analogy that's drawn here. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of much glory, than, uh, uh, much more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken of afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Our confession is a commitment. That, uh, the, the word there, commitment, uh, is the word homologia, which is a statement of allegiance. Do kids, do, are you required to do the Pledge of Allegiance in school still? Yes. Okay, great. I'm so glad to hear that. And, and what is the purpose of that? Uh, we're, all, we're, all na uh, we're all citizens of this, of this country attending a public school that is provided by taxpayers. And so the Pledge of Allegiance is said to say, hey, if you're, if you're benefiting of the public schooling, then the least you can do is to say that you'll be a faithful citizen of the country you're in and hopefully, you know, not be a traitor. <laughs> that's what, an, alle uh, that's what a, uh, uh, an allegiance is. A, so a statement of allegiance is. We, when we make a commitment to God, when we say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I'm saying that therefore my life has to change. Amen. My life has to be like the man who I am confessing, the God who I am confessing. As Jesus was faithful in this, uh, this passage here in, Math, uh, in Hebrew chapter 3, we see, so Moses was faithful. Moses upheld that household that was, that was given to him. And because of his faithful uh, management of that house, the church was able to come about eventually. A greater household. When we confess Christ, what we're doing is we're making a commitment to faithfulness. A lifetime of being in faith. A lifetime of doing as God asks. So Christians, we have to be committed to that lifetime of faithful service. Many profess to be Christians, but will fall back to worldly living the moment they're confronted with temptation. So if we're not faithful, we, are, we need to understand that we will not enter his rest. What does Revelation 2, 10 say? But be faithful unto death, and you will receive the crown of life. Anything less than that, then we will not be successful. Last thing I just want to look, look at here in Hebrews chapter 4. 
let us boldly come to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What does Jesus offer to us but grace to all who submit before his throne? He understands us is what we, lead, uh, we read in verse 15. He's not a king that you have to wait until you're summoned to his, his throne room. You're not, he's not a king where if you're a lowly peasant, if you're, if you're not of the right financial status or the right amount of, uh, of notoriety, then you can't even come before him. Instead, he is one who knows his subjects intimately and understands our heart. And so he welcomes all before him freely because he can sympathize with us because he lived as us and was tempted in all ways like us. And most importantly, he's willing to forgive us. We can come before the throne of grace. And and the Hebrew writer tells us we can do that boldly. We don't have to fear. We don't have to, uh, to have any kind of apprehensions about it. We can come before God and say, please, Father, forgive me. Give me that forgiveness that you promised me. And I know you'll be faithful to to give it freely. We can come to him with confidence is what verse 16 says. Come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help of need. In this passage, we can find out uh, very confidently what kind of high priest Jesus is for us. And if we turn over to the ninth chapter of Hebrews, in verse 15, we see that maybe a little bit clearer about who he is. And for this reason, verse 15, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the, of the internal inheritance. We can be confident because Jesus is a mediator for us. He speaks on our behalf. He, uh, when we come before the Lord on the day of judgment and we have all these sins in our path, uh, past, Jesus says, yes, but, we've, but I have washed those sins away. And he can make a just judgment according to that truth, that he has forgiven those sins. And we can be confident in that forgiveness. Look in the eighth chapter of Hebrews in verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's a promise to us. When we sin, we can rest assured that our high priest will receive us. If we are willing to turn from sin, we will obtain mercy. And when we struggle, Jesus tells us that he is able to help us in our time of need. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the promises of our high priest? As we go through life, it's going to be easy to look to the world to feed our desires. The world is filled with distractions to take our eyes off of our eternal goal. God forbid that we allow ourselves to come short of that rest. Look in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 again, where he says, Therefore, since a promise remains... To entering, of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. We need that let us diet. Let us be diligent to enter that rest by obedience. Let us hold fast to our confession through commitment to him, and let us come full, uh, boldly before the throne of grace in repentance. Let us have an attitude to enter that rest. Let us focus on heaven and let us focus on Christ. If you have not made Christ your focus in your life, if you have not made heaven your focus, you can change that tonight. 
If you've not been, a, uh, been baptized and become a Christian yet, why wait any longer? Why would you give up the opportunity to have that rest promised to you by your Lord and Savior who gave himself for you, who can sympathize with everything that you've been through and say you are forgiven? There is nothing that you could have done in your life that can keep you from God's grace. He is willing to forgive because he loves you. If you need to be forgiven of sins or if you need to enter the kingdom of God by being baptized into his church, please do so right now while we stand and sing.